In our ongoing study in the Gospel of John, we are now in chapter 11. Chapter 11, 1 through 44, is about the death and resurrection of Lazarus. But this recording right now is chapter 11, 1 through 16, about the death of Lazarus, the events leading up to, and then the death of Lazarus. At this point, actually, we are entering a new major section in the Gospel of John. Carson labels it transition, life and death, king and suffering servant, 11, 1 through 12, 50. And the section under that might be the death and resurrection of Lazarus, 11, 1 through 44. Now, at the end of chapter 10, the situation of the Lord Jesus in Israel there is, it's unclear. Many times the leaders have tried and failed to seize him and kill him. Many people have believed in him, even on the other side of the Jordan, right recently. However, by the end of chapter 11 now, his situation was absolutely clear. After the news of the resurrection of Lazarus spread, the leaders felt that they had to oppose him. Of course, they could have accepted him, but they felt that they had to oppose him. They conspired to kill him. Through this greatest of miracles, the resurrection of Lazarus, witnessed by many, even by some that went and reported to the Pharisees, the Lord Jesus forced them to make their decision about him. So now, the death of Lazarus, chapter 11, verses 1 through 16. This portion gives the background of the resurrection of Lazarus. The main point seems to be that the Lord was not there, intentionally was not there when he was sick, and he didn't go when he heard that Lazarus was sick. Basically, putting it coarsely, I guess, he let Lazarus die without being there to heal him so that he could resurrect him. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now there was a certain sick man, Lazarus, from Bethany, of the village of Mary and Martha, her sister. The name Lazarus is only used in chapters 11 and 12 of the Gospel of John and chapter 16 in the Gospel of Luke. But those two passages speak of two different men, both coincidentally called Lazarus, and both actually died. But other than that, there are no similarities. In John 11 and 12, Lazarus was raised from the dead, but in Luke 16, that Lazarus was not at all resurrected. In John 11 through 12, Lazarus had two sisters and a home, but the Lazarus of Luke 16 was a beggar. The name Lazarus in English is how we pronounce the Greek version of the Hebrew name Eleazar, which means God has helped. And it was a fairly common name. This Bethany is located on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. Remember you have the Mount Zion where Jerusalem and the temple was. You, and you go towards the east, you go downhill to the, to, the, to the brook Kidron, and then you climb up the not really very high hill called the Mount of Olives. It's actually higher than Mount Zion. That's Mount, Mount of Olives. If you continue on and go down the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives, you get to this Bethany. It was about three kilometers from Jerusalem, according to chapter 11, verse 18. And it was on the road to Jericho. Now, <laughs> here's a little bit, something a little bit confusing. To distinguish this place from the Bethany across the Jordan that's mentioned in 128, John explains that this is the village of Mary and her sister Martha. The word, the, and the wording of that is, seems a bit odd to us because Lazarus doesn't just live in the same village as Mary and her sister Martha. Lazarus is their brother, as we learn in the next verse. Chapter 11, verse 2. Now this was Mary that anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. Mary was a common name. Moses' sister was named Miriam which in Greek became Mariam and sometimes Maria, which later, much later in English became Mary or Miriam also. Well, the story of that anointing will be told in chapter 12 verses one through eight. Perhaps it's mentioned here ahead of time to draw attention to the closeness 
between the, the family of Mary and Lazarus and Martha and the Lord Jesus. Chapter 11, verse 3. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, look, the one you love is sick. Just a few notes here. Lord here is the word kurios, and it could be used of the Lord God Almighty, and it could mean sir. It's ambiguous. And the one you love, the word one here, the Greek is han, it's masculine. So they know that he, they must be talking about their brother, Lazarus. And love here is the verb phileo, not the verb agapao, but those verbs are actually quite similar. The one you love is sick. Now, assuming John has recorded the entire message, there are two elements left unstated. Lazarus' name is not spoken, nor is the request to heal him. To some, this might seem strange, but cultures familiar with indirect forms of communication would recognize this as an indirect request for healing. Chapter 11, verse 4. But hearing, Jesus said, This sickness is not fatal, or not to death, literally, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God might be glorified through it. This situation and the statement are similar to chapter 9, verse 3. There the Lord Jesus explained that the man was born blind, what? So that the works of God might be manifested in him. In the Gospel of John, the glory of God and the glory of the Son of God are closely related. This observation strongly supports the other teachings in the Gospel of John concerning the divinity of the Lord Jesus, because the glory of God is something that God Almighty alone possesses. It's unique to God. There's no one else whose glory resembles the glory of God. The Lord Jesus is fully, fully, fully divine. Chapter 11, verse 5. Now Jesus loved, and this is agapao love, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. He delayed their departure, but not because he didn't love them. Chapter 11, verse 6. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed in the place where he was for two days. At that time, healing the sick was not the miracle that God the Father wanted. The Lord Jesus waited for Lazarus to die so that he could raise him from the grave. A normal healing, as wonderful as that might be, is not what is required now in the plan of God. A resurrection is needed. Chapter 11, verse 7. Then after this, he says to the disciples, let us go back to Judea. Now, their location at this time is, it's actually difficult to determine. It is the place where John was first baptizing, according to 1040, and according to 128, that place was called Bethany beyond the Jordan. Now, a man named Reasoner, in an article, Bethany beyond the Jordan, John 128, in the Tyndale Bulletin in 1987, he did a lot of research on this, and he seems to have figured out that this place was the Old Testament location called Bashan, and it was northeast of the Sea of Galilee. So after two days, the Lord learned, apparently through inspiration, that Lazarus was dead. So now they could depart from that area, Bethany, northeast of the Sea of Galilee, for the village of Bethany near Jerusalem. So they went from one Bethany to another Bethany. His attitude in this section proves that he never retreated from opposition because of fear. Now, Carson and other commentators explained that it was considered appropriate that a healthy person could walk 40 to 45 kilometers per day during that era in Israel. So their journey from the Bethany northeast of the Sea of Galilee to the Bethany near Jerusalem must have taken two days if we compare 11.6 with 11.17. This does not make sense if the Bethany across the Jordan was near its traditional site near Jericho. That place would have required a much shorter walk. Chapter 11, verse 8. 
the disciples say to him, Rabbi, now the Jews were seeking you to stone you, and you're going back there? A couple of notes here. The Jews were seeking, that's the Greek verb zeteo in the imperfect tense. They were seeking and seeking and seeking. Over and over again, they were seeking. They kept seeking. <laughs> and seeking you to stone you. Well, that second you is actually not in the Greek text, but we put it in in English because we don't just say seeking you to stone. We have to say to stone you. So the Lord's plan to re return to Judea troubled his disciples. It seems like they withdrew from there because he was almost killed, and yet he wants to go back there? And in a way, they're right. If the Lord goes, he will be killed. Indeed, that is precisely what happened. More than that, from a certain point of view, it could be said that he was killed because he raised Lazarus. But the Lord did not consider danger when he made his decisions about when and where he would travel. Chapter 11, verse 9. Jesus replied, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If someone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. This is a strange response. He's speaking about walking during the daylight hours and not stumbling. There's a metaphor here. It's a challenge. The challenge is, as long as God the Father wants a certain ministry to happen, we need not fear danger. Now, a little note here about the word hour. <laughs> Today, in the modern world, the hour is a reference to a 60-minute time period. But it wasn't really always so. People actually had hours long before they had accurate ways to measure how many minutes were in an hour. In the New Testament times, each hour, whether a long summer day's hour or a short winter day's hour, was defined as one-twelfth of a day. Therefore, it was perfectly accurate of the Lord to say, are there not twelve hours in a day? Because in their way, with their meaning for the word hour, every day had twelve hours. People that live a significant distance away from the equator understand that in the winter a day is shorter than twelve hours, and in the summer a day is longer than twelve hours. But that's not relevant here because, again, in that context, every day, summer or winter, was divided up into 12 hours. But here's the most important thing for us in this passage. Just as God has appointed 12 hours for every day, and people walking during those 12 hours won't stumble because they see, by the light of this world, they see by regular physical light, so God has appointed for each of us a specific number of hours and days of life in which to serve him. We can fearlessly use those days to serve him without being afraid of somehow dying early. This is a lesson for us. And it was a lesson for those disciples as well. The Lord Jesus knew that God wanted him to go to Judea, so he was not afraid of danger. He obeyed the Father's will, and he was sure that there was no death outside the Father's will. Chapter 11, verse 10. But if he walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not with him. Because he's used the expression, the light of this world, in the previous verse, it seems that both of these verses are simply saying that walking while the sun is up is safe and walking when the sun is down is not safe. Likewise, meta that's the literal, but the metaphorical meaning is that Serving God during your appointed years, days, and years of service is not dangerous. You cannot die early while serving God, even if you are doing things that others might consider dangerous. This should be a great comfort to those involved in dangerous ministries, and it should give courage to believers that are afraid of entering into potentially dangerous ministry. Chapter 11, verse 11. He said these things, and after this he says to them, Lazarus, our friend, has fallen asleep, but I am going that I might wake him up. The verb fallen asleep, has fallen asleep, is koimao in the perfect tense. It's in the perfect tense. Usually that, that's a past event that has ongoing consequences, like in this case, 
staying asleep or staying dead, but uh, we see that those consequences are not ongoing here. <laughs> By fallen asleep, of course, the Lord Jesus means that Lazarus has died. Sleep in the New Testament is a common metaphor for death. We might look at Matthew twenty-seven fifty-two. Acts seven sixty also Acts thirteen thirty six First Corinthians seven thirty nine. You might have to look at the Greek for that though. And first Corinthians. 11.30, you could look at 1 Thessalonians 4.13 and 14 and 15, various places in the New Testament. It's less common in the Old Testament, but you can see Jeremiah 51.39 and also Daniel 12.2. Death is as temporary as sleep is a valuable faith lesson for all disciples. Chapter 11, verse 12. His disciples said, Lord, Kurios, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll be delivered. The word delivered here is a translation of the word sozo, often translated saved. If he's fallen asleep, he'll be saved. If he's fallen asleep, he'll be delivered. We need to be careful when we see this Greek word sozo, or the noun soteria, we need to be careful how to translate this word. It's certainly not always about eternal salvation. And this word is used six times in the Gospel of John. Uh, this pattern of speech is common in the Gospel of John. A statement is made by the Lord Jesus. It's misunderstood by, in this case, the disciples. And then the Lord Jesus explains, and his disciples respond. At this point, they do not understand that the term asleep has a figurative meaning. Also, the message from Martha and Mary was that Lazarus was sick, not dead. His disciples' error, misunderstanding, is, is, is understandable. Chapter 11, verse 13. But Jesus had spoken concerning his death, but they suppose that he speaks concerning the sleep of slumber. In English, we have two different words for sleep. We have sleep and slumber. So does Greek. And in this verse, the first verb is koimesis, translated sleep. And then the second verb, which was translated slumber, is hypnos, hypnos, like hypnotism. So this is the explanation of the misunderstanding. Chapter 11, verse 14 and 15. So then Jesus spoke to them openly. Lazarus has died. And I rejoice on your account, so that you might believe, because I was not there. But let us go to him. The Lord Jesus was glad that he was not there when Lazarus was sick. The sign that he was about to perform will be a greater sign than a simple healing of someone that's sick. So they will have a greater opportunity to believe. Once again, Signs bring faith. Signs can bring faith. But didn't they already believe in the Lord? Look at chapter 2, verse 11. Jesus did this beginning of signs in Cana of Galilee, and he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. And you could look at Peter's confession in John six sixty nine, And we have come to believe, and we have come to know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But here, they're going to believe because of this sign. Perhaps he's speaking of believing more deeply. That would be supported by the shallowness of Thomas's faith in the following verse. Chapter 11, verse 16. So Thomas, the one called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go as well, so that we might die with him. Now the name Thomas, Thomas in Greek, comes from the term twin in Hebrew, which is to'om and Aramaic to'oma. The nickname 
Didymos, didumos in Greek, means twin in Greek. The New Testament doesn't say anything about Thomas's twin sibling. Thomas's attitude and behavior are described in 14.5 and 20.24 through 29 and 21.2. The synoptic gospels mention Thomas's name, but only as one of the disciples of the Lord Jesus. You can see that in Matthew 10.3, for instance. And the expression, to his fellow disciples, is literally to the with disciples in Greek. Now, Thomas, he did not prioritize his own safety. He wasn't afraid. In that respect, his attitude is praiseworthy. But his comment also shows that he didn't really understand. And we do not seem to understand either, not when it comes to stepping forward for dangerous tasks. We frequently don't understand either. Thomas continued to be weak in faith, at least until he saw the resurrected Lord. Here, at least, he was willing to die for the Lord. That's devotion to the Lord, but it's not deep understanding and faith. So, by way of summary of this passage, thus we learn about the events leading up to the death of Lazarus and his resurrection. Certainly, the Lord could have gone and healed him, but the Lord had something greater in mind.